It is my pleasure to introduce Carlos Vargas Irwin and Tommy Hosman, uh, who will be discussing dimensionality reduction with us in general, and starting with this provocative title, <laughs> Does UMAP Lie? So, Carlos, please take it away. Uh, all right. I have, um, have to thank uh, uh, John uh, Donahue for uh, pointing me towards this uh, particular piece of art. Uh, uh, that we have in the cover, and we'll we'll talk about it more uh, in a in a little bit. But uh, but first, just uh, starting from from basics, uh, what do we mean when we say dimensionality reduction? So very simply, it's just uh, creating a one to one mapping from one space into a lower dimensional one. For example, here we have a bunch of points in three dimensions, and we're creating a map of those points in, uh, in two dimensions, such that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the points. So really, that's all dimensionality reduction is. But uh, why would we want to, to do this? Um, well, sometimes our, our data just comes in very high dimensional format, be it hundreds of electrodes, or thousands of genes, or, or many other examples. Uh, but even though the data itself may be high dimensional, uh, it may still um, not necessarily be using each of those dimensions independently. There may be some redundance and the, the true structure of the data may lie in some much lower uh, dimensional manifold. Uh, I also have a little plug here for, for Flatland, the uh, uh, really fun book to read, but the, the whole premise is if you're a one dimensional creature, you can't conceive of two dimensions. Uh, and similarly, we as three-dimensional creatures can't really conceive of like four and five dimensions. So uh, reducing dimensionality can also be uh, useful just to, to be able to visualize uh, our data and uh, come up with hypotheses uh, and just try to, to figure out how things fit, uh, fit together. Uh, also, uh, it can be a, a technique for, for feature extraction uh, because say if I, if I want to, if I have, thousand dimensional data and I want to model, to say, to fit a distribution to it, it's going to be a lot harder to do in a very high number of dimensions. So, uh, so it can be often the um, easier to run many different types of algorithms if we reduce the dimensionality first and can even improve our classification as well. All right. So um, what does it mean to have good dimensionality reduction? So uh, this, uh, yeah, this, uh, this image uh, is very interesting. So it literally is a pile of garbage. But if you shine, well, pile of garbage with two seagulls fighting over it. But uh, if you shine a light on it, it projects this two-dimensional image on the wall. And you can see sort of two, two people reclining there with, uh, yeah, with drinks and, and a, potentially a cigarette. But uh, the idea is um, that... Yeah, uh, this is a valid form of dimensionality reduction. You go from three to two, but is it actually telling you something useful about the data? And although this looks kind of ridiculous, when you have really high dimensional data, in general, it is possible to find rotations that will give you almost anything you want. So it's possible in a sense to, to sort of overfit your dimensionality reduction uh, and get an almost arbitrary result. So, so what does it mean for dimensional reduction to be good? Uh, so ideally, we want points that are close together in the high dimensional data to also be close together in the low dimensional data. And uh, we refer to this as preserving the, the local neighborhoods. Uh, ideally, the, the converse will be true. So things that are far apart in uh, the high dimensional data are also far apart. And uh, so groups of points uh, in relation to each other uh, should also be uh, have the same um, uh, have the same structure. So this is uh, this is more uh, like preserving the global structure of the data, and uh, so this, these are just general guidelines. Depending on what you want to do with your data, you might want to emphasize one over the other, or you might not even care necessarily about the global structure. And we'll we'll get into uh, into that uh, a little bit more later. All right. So, so that's sort of the intuition for what's good versus bad in dimensionality reduction. But let's get a, a little bit more precise. And uh, we're going to introduce uh, four metrics. And actually, these, uh, these come from um, uh, a paper 
uh, by uh, Kovac and colleague and colleagues. Uh, and uh, it's nice because the, we have metrics that capture local structure and metrics that capture global structure. So for local structure, um, we can run a k-nearest neighbor classification. So simply, that's just taking. I take one point uh, in my low-dimensional space, and I say, well, what are the what are the neighbors to that point? And depending on what uh, what um, if assuming that my points have different classes, I see what, uh, what are the classes of the neighbors and then I classify it, uh, my points based on that. And how often I'm right, meaning how often the same, uh, the, the local neighborhoods are preserved in this way is, uh, is my metric. I can also um, look at, uh, in addition to just whether I classify each point correctly, I can also look at the fraction of nearest neighbors that are preserved uh, when I go from high dimensions to low dimensions. Meaning is yeah is my, my local neighborhood really the same or not? Uh, for global structure, uh, we have something similar, but instead of a nearest neighbors, this is a nearest class. So uh, there, I look at the, the means of the different classes, and there is a relationship between the means of the classes uh, also preserved. Uh, and finally, the last one is a, a Spearman correlation, uh, just saying if, if uh, uh, two points are close together in the high dimensional space, are they also likely to be close together in the low dimensional space? And this is nice because it, it, it also applies to the converse. So for, for our points are far away in one, also far away in the other. And uh, we'll show some results with these uh, in a little bit. All right, so now let's talk about um, different methods for dimensionality reduction. So I'm gonna start with the more, uh, detailed and somewhat technically rigorous description, but then we'll go through just some intuition uh, about uh, how they work. So uh, we're going to be talking about three, uh, in particular PCA, principal component analysis, and that, uh, that works by finding orthogonal linear transformations to maximize data variance. Uh, we also have uh, TSNE, uh, T-distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding, uh, and uh, that one focuses on, uh, on preserving the local structure by matching the KL divergence between high and low dimensional data. Uh, and finally, we have a UMAP, um, Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection, which also works on the local neighborhoods, but uh, minimizes cross entropy uh, between them and also represents the data as um, an approximated manifold uh, using um, graph theory. Okay, so that's kind of the, the high or, or the, the more technical description. Now, just for a, a quick primer on how these things work. So for PCA, uh, let's say we have a cloud of points. All we're doing is we're looking for the orthogonal uh, directions of maximum variance and making that our new axes. So this example here is nice uh, because if you look just at the distribution of points for variable A and variable B, uh, you can't really tell apart uh, your two classes. But uh, once you take uh, the first principal component uh, that here lies uh, sort of in the diagonal, um, you, can, uh, you, you can get a nice separation between the two and everything looks nice and, uh, and orderly. So that's a, you know, a pretty uh, standard, nice linear uh, way to, uh, to get, uh, in this case, potentially from two dimensions to one dimension or from any arbitrary number to reduce. All right, so now let's talk about uh, TSNE. So uh, again, let's assume we have, a, let's assume we have a, these points in a 2D uh, space and we want to project them to a one uh, dimensional space. Although of course this will apply regardless in, in much higher numbers of uh, dimensions. So uh, we could actually use PCA <laughs> and uh, later we'll, uh, we'll see that, um, that this can be a, a good idea. Um, but the way uh, the sort of plain vanilla version of TSME works is uh, it's actually you start with a random arrangement of the points. So uh, next, uh, I want you to imagine that uh, if, we look at the, uh, if we look at the high dimensional space, imagine that, all, uh, that the nearest neighbors to each point, so here I've highlighted one point in red, Assume that all the nearest neighbors are attached to that point with springs and that the springs 
are stronger or stiffer, the closer the points are together. So this one that's right next to it has a nice uh, strong spring. The ones that are far away have a sort of weaker pull. Now let's assume that these strings remain detached when the points randomly drop into your one dimensional space. So uh, the idea is to, to, to imagine what will happen as each point sort of pulling on those nearest uh, neighbors and how they might be rearranged. Uh, it's important to know that here I'm showing one, uh, one point, but this will happen for each point independently. Uh, also, uh, the number of nearest neighbors, so the number of, um, of springs attached to each point is, um, is one of the parameters that you can adjust in TSME uh, roughly uh, called the, the perplexity. So hopefully, if we, uh, if we do that and everything works correctly, uh, we can get something like this. The, all the, the things that are all the points that are nearest neighbors in the high dimensional space pull their nearest neighbors together in the low dimensional space, and we get a nice classification uh, or a nice uh, order of the points that preserves those local uh, neighborhoods. Uh, one important thing is that uh, to note that the size of the neighborhood is defined by the number of neighbors and not by an actual volume. And uh, that gives uh, TSNE uh, a lot of flexibility because uh, essentially uh, you can have smaller neighborhoods where the data is very dense and, uh, and larger neighborhoods where your data is very sparse. Uh, so, uh, and also just one little side note, we're not talking about uh, multidimensional scaling MDS, but uh, MDS works very much the same way, except you actually specify a volume instead of a number of points. All right, so that's uh, TSNE. Uh, UMAP uh, works in a similar fashion. So it's also um, trying to make the local neighborhoods as similar as possible. It uses a different set of metrics, uh, like we mentioned before, um, based on uh, entropy. Uh, and um, one other important difference with TSNE is that it has an additional hyperparameter, uh, the minimum distance, that determines how closely uh, points can be packed uh, together. So here we see, uh, we see an example of how a uh, number of neighbors, so it also has a number of neighbors param parameter that's very similar to perplexity in TSNE. So here we see um, how the number of neighbors and the minimum distance affect uh, an embedding. Here, the, the true embedding is sort of like a three-dimensional uh, trefoil uh, pattern uh, that, uh, and you can see that it will, um, with sufficient neighbors, uh, you, you will capture it accurately. Uh, and you can sort of see how the, uh, the minimum distance also uh, can work to push the, the points apart and make, uh, uh, make the neighborhoods a bit less, uh, less cluttered. Uh, also notice that uh, depending on how many neighbors uh, you choose, you don't always get the, the true pattern. And we'll show some more examples uh, of that in a little bit. So uh, TSNE and UMAP have uh, recently been at, at the core of uh, um, for a bit of a controversy. Uh, there was um, uh, there was a paper uh, and oh actually I didn't add the citation here but we'll have it at the end. Uh, there was um, uh, a paper that um, essentially made the bold statement that the TSNE and UMAP uh, produces somewhat arbitrary shapes. And one of the arguments they used to prove this was uh, instead of um, instead of mapping uh, instead of deriving the the map from the data. Uh, they just picked an arbitrary shape, in this case, a little shape that looks kind of like an elephant, and forced the data onto that manifold. Uh, and the claim was that a lot of the metrics were just as good as the ones you get in, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from TSNE and UMAP. So that's, uh, uh, there's, there's differing opinions. And uh, the, um, uh, Dimitri Kovac, uh, in another paper that, uh, that we cited, uh, his claim is that they, uh, in the original, in the original study, they did not uh, apply sufficient metrics to really tell apart um, the the different embeddings, and that, it, uh, for example, if you do uh, nearest neighbor classification, then the little uh, elephant uh, Picasso, that's sort of like forcing the the shape of the the data into the elephant shape, uh, is not as good at, at classifying as uh, as a yeah, UMAP or TSME. Uh, 
So um, here, um, uh, next, what we're, what we're going to do is, uh, is actually look at some data sets that, uh, that we made in-house uh, that I think highlight some of the features uh, that we're interested in and maybe uh, some of the ways in which uh, these different algorithms can go uh, awry. So uh, our, uh, for our simulated data, we chose uh, uh, sort of a, a Nautilus shape. And uh, well, one, uh, one thing that I like about this and the, the reason we, uh, we came up with it is that uh, you, have, um, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have local structure, but you also have global structure. And actually you, you also have uh, changes in variance for your different clusters. Uh, and uh, before we talked um, about how, uh, how TSME and, uh, and UMAP care about number of neighbors and not space, and we'll see how that affects uh, the data when we have this property of uh, uneven uh, cluster variance. Uh, all right, so uh, there's our, we saw the ground truth. This is what you can actually pull out with PCA, UMAP, uh, and TSME. The, this is an example of, uh, of what comes out of the three algorithms uh, after some optimization. And we'll, we'll show you some of the, the fail cases uh, when the optimization was not as good uh, in a little bit. But um, one thing that, was a, uh, that, that makes sense, but it's still a little bit surprising to me is that in some cases, uh, PCA can actually do a better job than some of the fancier algorithms, depending on, on, on what you care about. So uh, PCA actually does uh, preserve, for example, the, the variance of the clusters uh, such that the outer clusters are bigger. Just uh, because of the way UMAP and TSNE work, um, that, that kind of information is lost, but we still get uh, a nice cluster separation. Uh, the, the other point is um, more uh, also still looking at the global structure. The real data is uh, in a uh, does have a spiral shape, uh, and here we see that uh, that's largely lost in TSNE and UMAP. UMAP gives you more of a um, more of a horseshoe, and TSNE gives you a bit more of a circle in this case. Uh, regardless, uh, we, uh, we you can still notice that the order of the clusters is still uh, is still the same. So in that sense, it is. Uh, preserving the local neighborhoods, but it is losing a little bit of that uh, global structure. So I mentioned that these are the examples when the data, um, or sorry, when the hyperparameters, uh, meaning the perplexity uh, and the uh, number of neighbors and the minimum distance for UMAP uh, were optimized. Here, uh, oh, but actually, sorry, before we, uh, before we do that, let's look at some metrics for, for this particular space. <coughs> So as I mentioned before, uh, we have nearest neighbor classification. And that one, uh, essentially, all the, the three maps do great, uh, which is not surprising. We see that all the, um, all the points, uh, all, all the classes uh, group pretty nicely for all the algorithms. Uh, k and m fraction, meaning uh, what fraction of the local neighborhood is, is preserved, is also uh, about the same for the three algor algorithms. But uh, as, as you might have expected, when we look at global structure, so uh, whether the, the centroids or the, the means of the classes um, relate to each other in the same way, uh, PCA actually does a little bit better. Uh, and also in the correlation between uh, the high and low dimensional distances, uh, PCA uh, does a little bit better. And uh, again, it, it depends on what you, what you care about. If, uh, if you're building a classifier to distinguish these uh, these eight classes, uh, then maybe you don't care that <laughs> that you're losing the spiral shape. Uh, but it, it, or if you yeah if you um, but if for some reason you want to uh, you want to see where these lie with respect to each other, or if you want to evaluate the variance within these clusters, then UMAP and TSNE could uh, could potentially mislead you. Uh, also. Uh, the, the choice of hyperparameters is uh, important. So for, uh, for TSNE, here's a, a sweep over the, the number of neighbors. And you see that, that mostly you get that circular pattern. And you still get the, uh, the clusters more or less in the same order, but not always. There's a few, <coughs> excuse me, 
there's a few examples depend uh, depending on the number of uh, of neighbors that you get uh, where your clusters sort of start drifting uh, somewhat randomly with respect to each other. And you can either get a line uh, or sometimes you have some clusters that sort of uh, drift off by themselves. And uh, you can imagine if, um, if your neighborhood is smaller than the number of points in a cluster, uh, things like, uh, like this where things drift apart are more likely to happen. So generally speaking, it, it is easier to work with higher numbers of neighbors, but then this takes uh, extra, uh, extra time. Uh, similarly, for uh, for UMAP, oops, uh, did I get the? Oh, I'm sorry. I think I got the the same uh, picture for that one. That's okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry about the mix-up. We got the the wrong slide in there. But um, essentially, you see something very similar with uh, with UMAP, uh, where the the number of neighbors also affects how uh, how your clusters relate to each other. All right. So that's, uh, that was um, sort of a preview with, um, with synthetic data. Next, we're actually going to look at some, uh, some real uh, human uh, data that was uh, recently collected. Everyone, Tommy, and uh, so we're, we're looking at a, our participant, uh, T11, uh, and he is performing a task where he is uh, calibrating uh, and he is calibrating how he's going to use his attempted gesture movements. And we're going to be able to, we're building a decoder off that and we're allowing our participant to be able to do things like scroll up, um, you know, use, use a computer to uh, yeah, point and click, but, but uh, our participant can do other things like double click or scroll. And, uh, and so this, this is an example of him calibrating and uh, essentially, uh, what we're showing here is uh, that our participant is moving. So if you focus on this top square here that uh, with the eight circles on the eight blue circles and the red circle in the middle, uh, and then the white circle, the white circle is a participant's cursor and he's attempting to move the cursor uh, to the red circle. And whenever he gets onto the red circle, he will be uh, attempting to make a that the particular movement and that particular movement there is a middle finger press, uh, so that that is the task that we're uh, essentially using for the, the neural data. And if you want to go to the next slide, uh, oh, just, just oh, uh, yeah, one uh, one quick note, uh, just uh, just to mention because everyone here may not be familiar with the, this type of work. So uh, T11 is a part participant in the BrainGate two clinical trial. Uh, and uh, he had a, a spinal cord injury and has very limited uh, mobility of, um, uh, of his hands, but his movement and tension is being um, assessed through uh, intracortical microelectrode arrays in, uh, in his precentral gyrus. And that's how uh, we're getting the, uh, the data that you see here. Now we have applied the same analyses that we applied with the simulated data where we're using where you look at either the PCA, you know, more rigid linear projection, uh, or these nonlinear uh, methods, UMAP, TSNE. Um, and, and what you see are uh, individual uh, uh, time steps uh, across the, the calibration task. And uh, we have them color coded. The purple and green, purple through green shades are when participant was attempting a particular gesture and the red through blue uh, colors are when our participant was moving uh, across the screen with the, across the, with his cursor and uh, one one interesting point to note out is that um, while you, you kind of see similar large uh, structure uh, like where, where the different classes are across PCA, UMAP, and TSNE. Uh, interestingly, UMAP and TSNE have uh, still maintained this circular structure uh, in, the, in the red to blue for the kinematics. Um, and you could intuit that um, as our participant is moving um, it in up, down, left, right, kind of in a circular space, uh, uh, UMAP and TSNE are able to 
capture that sort of, um, well, I guess, lower dimensional structure there. Um, Tommy, the, you, you may have mentioned already, but I um, just want to check how, how much data are you presenting? Is it like from one block or from multiple sessions? This is just one box worth of data. Um, so it's about, it's five minutes of, of data was, was total there, but we're only collecting, we're, we're only analyzing a few time points per, per uh, trial. So it ends up being uh, a thousand time, time points. Um, and just to do the quick thousand. Uh, so I guess that is about only 20 seconds worth of data that we're, we're looking at here. Got it. Thank you for that question. There's also one in the chat. Uh, was there any particular reason for the two components in PCA, but three for the others? Or, you know, are we making a fair comparison, okay. I guess, is the bigger hmm. question. In that. Um, yeah, so there, well, they're all three in uh, with three components here. Uh, just the PCA I, I left with, uh, I, I suppose I should have uh, altered it a little bit. The, the structure is, you know, there is, uh, yeah, there is some more structure in PCA, uh, I, but I wanted to highlight with UMAP and TSNI the circular structure uh, from the kinematics as, as a participant was moving the cursor, which is not uh, in PCA. And, and so what we can see here is that uh, PCA does not do quite as well in the local structure for, for both instances, and whereas UMAP and TSNI do much better. Uh, in this instance, TSNI is outperforming uh, or has better metrics in both the K nearest neighbor classification as well as uh, the K nearest neighbor uh, fraction. Um, but, but typically, from what we've seen, those, those can vary uh, a little bit. Uh, and, and it's not always TSNI over UMAP or, or UMAP over TSNI for that matter. Um, and likewise, whenever we go to the global structure, we can see interestingly here, both uh, all three PCA, UMAP and DSNE are capturing a, a decent amount as far as the classes go. Um, but uh, a PCA as, as expected will typically capture this, the global uh, structure distance, uh, distances uh, and, their, and their correlation as, as UMAP and TSNE uh, somewhat break that up as they as they try to you know maintain and, and cluster those local uh, points. To some some broader questions here, we we've looked at unsupervised methods today and and de demonstrated an, an a linear rigid one PCA and that's quite common and, and we can see that it worked reasonably well. Um, uh, but, but doesn't always capture that local structure quite as well and might not uh, do as great at, uh, for clustering or for uh, classification. Um, but but uh, the other, other method, uh, excuse me, other methods that we're looking at, um, they might not be able to do things as well or as quickly like uh, transforming new data uh, into into the same space, uh, and so there, there are a lot of considerations uh, when you're thinking about doing dimensionality reduction uh, beyond uh, beyond just how well is it keeping global and local structure. Uh, if you want to apply, you know, if you want to put new data into these same spaces, that might either take time, uh, and if you're trying to do something in real time, that might be difficult. So. Uh, so there's some additional challenges uh, that that you might want to think about, um, and I guess finally, as a as another comment in terms of other things to consider, there are other dimensionality reduction methods like uh, LDA, where they are supervised and and they actually and their intent is to uh, be able to maximize your ability to discriminate between clusters, uh, and so these are totally unsupervised, which as we saw, it can be great uh, in terms of being able to find these interesting data points even without any labels. Uh, so if you don't have labeled data, but but there are you know, additional uh, supervised methods. Yeah, and uh, one thing that we also um, 
didn't dwell into too much is uh, computational complexity, just runtime. And the, it's worth mentioning that uh, UMAP is considerably faster than, uh, than TSNI. Uh, and actually, Tommy, you might know better than I, like uh, how much faster is it? Yeah, um, I have a plot. It's usually at least double as fast and, and it can depend on the method that you're using, whether uh, sometimes there are, uh, as, we can, as you can see in the references, we pointed to uh, one of the repositories we pointed to is a is a fast uh, 2D version of TSNI, and uh, and that's using the fast Fourier transform to help um, kind of speed things up. So it, it can depend on the method that you're using, but uh, in general, TSNI is uh, about uh, like twice as slow, if not more, and that that definitely gets worse as you add more and more data points. Uh, so TSNI doesn't scale as well as UMAP, um, and and so those are those things to consider. And and uh, my my personal bias, whenever I'm using these methods for exploring, is is UMAP mainly for that reason, as I might want to iterate and sweep some hyperparameters uh, that allows me to uh, kind of find a a correct or an interesting hyperparameter to allow me to see interesting aspects of the data. Yeah, so maybe one of the take home messages can be, uh, well, first be clear on what you wanna get out of the dimensionality reduction. If all you want is for example, a, a better classifier, then yeah, then just look at the classification metrics and, and, and you can pick your dimensionality reduction uh, that way. As long as you do, of course, a proper cross validation and don't train and test on the same data. Um, but um, also, um, also that uh, the hyperparameters matter. So the number of neighbors uh, or and the minimum distance for UMAP uh, can really change your results. So it's definitely worth sweeping through those uh, and, and seeing how that affects uh, your results. Uh, and maybe looking at some of the, these other uh, metrics of um, uh, in addition to the, the local um, neighborhood, also the, the global structure metrics to, to at least get a feeling for where you are uh, with respect to, to other algorithms. 